Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, this is uh, Brother Jerry, and uh, I'm going to teach the uh, Sunday School lesson for May 17th this morning, and you'll see that uh, the title of the lesson is, if you have your books, is Jesus Reveals His Mission. And bear with me just a little bit. I'm just a little kind of hoarse and croupy a little bit. But uh, uh, the story is told <laughs> of a man who purchased a horse that formerly belonged to a preacher. The preacher told the man that in order to make the horse go, the command, praise the Lord, had to be given. To stop the horse, hallelujah, was the instruction. So the purchaser did all right in getting on the horse and you know, then once he was on the horse, he said, Praise the Lord, he shouted. The horse took off at a full gallop, just, just running. The man, uh, the problem was that the, that the horse was headed for a cliff. The man began to panic. Whoa, the man shouted, and he was pulling back on the reins, but to no avail. Suddenly he realized he had forgotten the command to stop the horse. But just in the nick of time, he remembered. Hallelujah! He shouted, and the horse came to a stop at the very edge of the cliff so that the new owner could look down in the chasm below. So he took a deep breath. He leaned back in the saddle, and he just started to feel a little bit religious. And so with great excitement and relief, he shouted, Praise the Lord. <laughs> he said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, today in our study, uh, we'll see where the Lord Jesus was accused of saying the wrong thing. And the crowd that was around him tried to throw him over a cliff. It was not for a slip of tongue uh, of our Lord Jesus because he never had a slip of a tongue. He uh, always uh, said things that his father had, 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 had uh, was instructing him to say. His whole goal and, and his, his, his ministry here, his purpose for, for coming to this earth was to do the Father's will and to do what pleased our Father and His Father in, in heaven. And so uh, everything he did was deliberate. Our text today is taken from Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 16 through 31. But before we do get into that, I want to point your attention back to uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. This kind of sets the stage here a little bit. At the beginning of that chapter, uh, the Lord Jesus had come, and uh, he was, he, 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 in, in chapter 3, uh, he, had he was baptized by John. And then in, at the beginning of chapter 4, uh, the... the uh, uh, he, he had come back from the temptation in the wilderness uh, there, and uh, he, he was hungry. You know, the devil had, had tempted him, and, tempted him and, uh, and uh, then we get down here to verse 14. And it says there, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by God. So he was in Galilee. He had not made it to uh, Nazareth by this time. He was spending a lot of time around Capernaum uh, there and whatever villages they, they had there where there was a synagogue. Uh, he was in the power of, of the Spirit. And uh, uh, so he, he comes to, uh, to uh, uh, we're going to find out that he comes to Nazareth here from here. But notice verse 15. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. He had, uh, his, his notoriety began to grow 
his, his fame and popularity uh, began to grow. And uh, this, incidentally, is what we're going to be talking about a little bit this morning, about the uh, uh, popularity and profits uh, as he comes here to uh, uh, the synagogue uh, there in, in Nazareth. And verse 16 is where we're going to uh, uh, pick it up right here. And uh, uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself right here. But let me just kind of point out uh, some other uh, things right here. Uh, many scholars believe that this visit into Nazareth here in the book of Luke uh, was uh, one of two visits that our Lord Jesus made. And, uh, and, and uh, they uh, say this because of the two accounts that are written about him in Matthew and Mark, two of the other synoptic gospels uh, which Luke is a part of. Uh, in those uh, visits there, the disciples are with him. But our Lord Jesus here, it appears that he is by himself in, uh, in this visit here by Luke. So this, everything that happened in verses 14 and 15 happened in, uh, in about a year's time. It's encapsulated in there in those, in those two verses. And um, you can find that uh, those things happened uh, uh, or recorded in John chapter 1, verses 19, uh, verse 19, all the way through chapter 4, verse, verse uh, 42. Uh, that happened during his first year. So uh, almost a year had passed, and he's coming uh, to Nazareth. And so... I thought about it when our Lord Jesus went to uh, Nazareth, uh, you know, uh, you know where he stayed, because it's assumed uh, uh, that because it doesn't uh, mention his brothers and sisters or anything so much uh, here. The only thing they mention is uh, Joseph, uh, that his parents, uh, his mother, and his brothers and sisters had moved to another village, and so. Uh, more than likely, he may have stayed with other relatives that were there, or maybe friends. And um, here, when he goes into the synagogue, just kind of get the setting a little bit here, that his, uh, it, it, it's, it's full of people uh, about his age who had grown up. Now they were married, they had children, and, uh, and they were looking forward to seeing him again. They had heard about the things he was uh uh, the miracles he was doing and uh, in, in, in Galilee and in Capernaum, we'll learn a little bit later, uh, and they were anxious to see and, and, and to hear what he would have to say uh, there. And so, uh, and again, Luke reminds us that he returns in the power of the Spirit. And um, just, just think, of, think on it just for a moment. Uh, Jesus was beginning his at the beginning of his ministry. He was the Holy Spirit came down on him at baptism. It led him in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and now he returns. And verse fourteen says he's in the power of the Spirit, and and we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit for whatever ministry we undertake here at ten twenty five Church. We, pray, we ought to pray for Brother Tommy to be empowered by the Holy Spirit when he's preaching, for Brother Jojo to be empowered by the Holy Spirit when he is uh, uh, leading the students and the children, uh, and, and, and for Nick when he does, uh, goes out and, 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 and does missions here in the, in the, in the community or wherever he's going, and for a crystal uh, while she's leading the music, the whole band, everything to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need. Okay, now let's start with uh, point number one. Jesus declared that he is the Messiah of Isaiah's prophet, a prophecy. And that uh, we find here is verses 16 through 22. And so let me read that. And it says, he, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And um, I, I want you to point your attention right here to what it says there, that that was his custom. That was uh, uh, 
his, as what I heard one preacher call it, he called it a holy habit. And I need that holy habit, uh, if you want to call it that, because I don't know about you, but over these past three months, I have missed coming and being with my other brothers and sisters in Christ. I miss the encouragement that I get. I miss just greeting, uh, seeing our, our folks. I miss just the, the involvement with Sunday school. I miss it all. And so I, it had become a real habit for me. And which, uh, incidentally, one thing we need to be careful of, I learned several years ago in a, in a time management seminar that the speaker said something I'll never forget. He says, typically it takes about three months for us to develop a habit. About three months. Now think about that just for a moment. We haven't been uh, together to worship in about three months. We don't want that kind of habit to, of staying home uh, and, and watching church on television to be what it's about. But if you're able, we want you to come this coming Sunday. Uh, on the 31st of May that we're going to meet at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock and we, we're just going to meet and worship the Lord because uh, that's what the Lord Jesus did there. And let me keep reading. And it says there that uh, he took, uh, he took he, and, and the book of the prophet uh, Isaiah was given to him because uh, he, he, had, uh, he was going to read that portion of property, uh, uh, prophecy uh, that was given to him here. And, and let me just kind of point out something else because uh, as the Lord Jesus began to read, there were, there were no chapter and verse divisions in the Scriptures. That didn't happen for a long time, until a long time after that. So we don't know how much exactly that he read right here. But Luke is careful to point this out. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And notice right there, if you've gone back and you've looked at Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, our Lord stops right there. And of course, because this was uh, the favorable day, uh, year of the Lord, because He had come, He had come to give His life, to shed His blood, to save us from our sins. It was not the day of vengeance of our, of our God, which is going to come. And, uh, and this, is, this is just one thing that we have to look forward to, I guess you could say, because uh, the, before that day of vengeance comes of our God, when He's going to come and judge this world, we're waiting for that rapture to take place. We're waiting for the Lord Jesus to come and take the church out of this world here. And so shall we ever be with Him, uh, as the Scripture says. And, of course, it says uh, there that he read this. And, and, and uh, let me go on uh, down here, find my place. And uh, verse 20 says, And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And uh, I'd just like to pull out, uh, point out something to you right here because... Uh, it required 10 Jewish men to uh, form a synagogue. And more than likely, like I'm sitting right here, uh, there are chairs right here, but on the front row of that synagogue there were probably the 10 Jewish men, probably elders who started this. And so uh, any other preacher boy would have been very nervous uh, to uh, have uh, to expound on the scriptures there, because these men, no doubt, had been in the synagogue most of their life. They, they they knew a lot of the scriptures, and they were very wise. That we would we would say after that, because customarily they would sit down sit down 
They, they, they would stand and read the scriptures. They would sit down to expound on it. And it says, uh, the eyes of all were fixed on him. They were looking at him. And they're saying, what is he going to say now? Because uh, uh, we're going to find out right here. And verse 21, uh, uh, I just point this out to you right here. And he began to say to them, Today, the scripture, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And that was just like dropping a bomb. Uh, to them, everything was going fine. And all at once, something comes out of his mouth that no one is, is expecting to hear. No one had ever made a claim uh, like that. And so... Uh, they 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 were pretty much in shock. I just think uh, to them that they, when they heard it, I think their eyes kind of bugged open, their mouth just dropped open, and they started turning to one another. Hey, did you hear what he just said? I, I can't believe he said that. And I'm and I'm sure their expectation about him was beginning to change right here. And, of course, uh, our Lord Jesus knows everything. But in verse 22 right here, uh, their, their doubt beginning to, was beginning to build. And they were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his mouth. And were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And all they could say, those older men would say, hey, we remember when this guy speaking here, was just one of the kids that grew up here. We knew him when he was little. We knew him when his nose was running. And his mom had changed his diapers. Uh, we knew when he got out and played with the other kids and maybe got banged up and scratched up when they scuffled and played and things of, of that sort. And uh, as he grew older, we knew there was something a little different about him. But we just thought it was just him growing into a teenager and a young man. But... Uh, that, but they just assumed that he was the son of Joseph. So he didn't have the money to go uh, to, to a, a, a Jewish college somewhere to be taught by Gamaliel. Uh, he didn't have the money uh, to do all that. And, there, and, there, and there, the other uh, uh, accounts given in Matthew 13 and in, and in and Mark chapter 6, you know, that... Where did he get all this learning? We don't know. We don't know. We just know he was poor like the rest of us here. So they, 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 and, and he knew that uh, there. And so uh, looking here at point number, number two, our, uh, Jesus predicted that he would be rejected like the prophets. So uh, before I go any farther, let me point out a verse of scripture here that said that he said, uh, uh, John said about him in John chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the, free, uh, the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. He knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. He knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So this leads to verse uh, 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 23. And uh, he says, and he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And, and think about it just for a moment. When you go to a doctor, you won't, don't want to go to a doctor who's sick. Okay? Uh, that's not well. You expect when you go to a doctor that he's healthy and that he, he, he is taking care of himself. And so he's in his right mind. And he'll know how to treat you, prescribe the right kind of, uh, of medicine, the antibiotics or whatever else that you may need when you go. Or if you go to a dentist, wouldn't you expect a dentist to have good teeth? 
and uh, not rotten teeth when you go to them because uh, who would go to somebody like that? So uh, evidently there was a well-known proverb here, but he says, uh, in effect, he knew what they were thinking because he goes on to say, whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Hey, they were just saying to him, we've heard everything that you've done there. Word has got around. People traveling from Capernaum have come down into uh, to Nazareth. Some who, maybe who were visiting the Sea of Galilee had a chance to hear you. They got to see that when you, uh, when you were healing people, that uh, when, when, when they brought the blind uh, to you, they left, they could see. The cripple, when they brought them to you, when they left, they could walk. Uh, the, 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 the ones that laying on stretchers uh, got up, took the stretcher, and walked. And, and I just believe to myself. I just believe in the power and the glory of our Lord Jesus and the power of my God. I believe that people who went uh, to Him and they, they were missing a hand, I believe when they came back, the hand was there, that they were whole. I believe if they were missing a, 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 a leg from the knee down or something, and uh, they were on crutches that they went and came back, and they were whole. I just believe that, that he was able to do that. Now, you may disagree, but I believe our God can do anything. And I believe, I believe our Lord Jesus, when he healed a person, they were healed uh, completely. So why not go to him? And so, but he goes on to say here, and this is, this is really what gets them in uh, verses 20. Uh, 5 through 27 and he and he said truly I say to you no prophet is welcome in his hometown and of course he may have been thinking uh, right then reminding them about Jeremiah Jeremiah was not a very popular prophet in his time uh, he was referred to many as the weeping prophet but nobody in Jerusalem liked what he had to say because he was calling them out for their sins their idolatry the injustice that they were uh, injustices that they were committing, the 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 judges taking bribes and the the kings just indulging in in every sinful practice that they shouldn't have been, and they were they were they they knew that the Babylonians were there about to destroy them, and and Jeremiah says they're coming. He says you're going to be in you're going to be in captive tip, uh, captivity for seventy years. And so they didn't like hearing all that. And then he goes on to say here, But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And, and of course, that, that's recorded in Second Kings uh, uh, for, I'm sorry, First Kings chapter 17 uh, there. Uh, Israel at that point, the ten northern kingdoms during the time of Elijah when there were two kingdoms, uh, uh, the kingdom uh, under Solomon was torn apart. The Ahab and, and Jezebel uh, had, had, had pulled the country into, into just a Baal worship, uh, uh, which is abominable to our God. And so God sent... Elijah the prophet to them. Ahab even referred to Elijah as being the troubler of Israel. But God sent him during that drought up to the Gentiles, up to Phoenicia, to Sidon, to that poor woman there. And if you remember, she just had enough oil to take care of her and her son. For one meal, but Elijah says, fix it for me first. And she did. And of course, the Bible says that the, that the oil and, and, the, and the flour, that, that never ceased while God was, uh, he was there doing what God told him to do. Verse 27, And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Nahum and the, the, uh, the Syrian. He, he was the captain there. And that's Second Kings chapter 5. And so... Uh, here he was in Israel, but they were so steeped in idolatry that nobody would come to him. But there was a, a prophet, there was a man of God in Israel. And 
because of a little Jewish girl speaking to him up in Syria. He came and he was healed of his leprosy. And leprosy was very loathsome at that time. And, and our Lord Jesus knew this. He says, they were Gentiles. God didn't bless them in those days. Israel in those days, God didn't bless Israel. But Gentiles, whom the Jewish people looked down upon, a lot of racial, racial prejudice that they had toward them. And, uh, and let me just kind of say this one thing. In the time that our Lord Jesus was here, you know how the Gospels say this, and even in the book of Acts, what happens because of the Jews, particularly the, the priests and the Pharisees. But the, the priest had corrupted the priesthood and the worship of God. They were using the house of God as a place to make money for merchandise. Uh, and when our Lord Jesus went and turned over the tables of the money changers because of the people coming to, to Passover uh, there, and the, the, the Pharisees, the Pharisees were so legalistic. Uh, they were so self-righteous that they placed the traditions of men higher than the Word of God. This was more important to them than obeying the Word of God. And where God says in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, He says, hey, I, what have I shown you, old man, what to do? But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. They were missing the whole picture uh, there. And so everything was corrupt. And uh, they even called the Lord Jesus in, in Luke chapter 7, verse 34. They called him a friend of, of uh, tax collectors and sinners. And which brings me to uh, 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 point number three. Our Lord Jesus continues his ministry despite being, uh, uh, the, despite the people's rejection of him there and this is verses 28 through 31 and look right here these people went from being glad uh, to mad right after this verse 28 and all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things you know just just to be compared uh, they, they were being shunned by a hometown boy that they came to hear and they really didn't believe him anyway because of what the Lord Jesus said about a prophet. And many times he considered himself to be a prophet. And uh, some com considered him to be the last prophet. And, and I know what the scripture says there in, in Acts about Agabus. But many people believe that the Lord Jesus was the last prophet uh, there. And they, they could not stand these people uh, being compared uh, to uh, as being worse or God was choosing, God chose Gentiles and they hated to hear that. They didn't like hearing that from a hometown boy that they knew growing up, growing up who, was, who was just poor. He didn't come back rich. He didn't come back with a bunch of servants or anything like that. But he came back just preaching the Word of God here and uh, Bob Neffenbaugh says this here. Uh, he's a uh, preacher that I, I, I study quite a bit. And he says about this here, Just as a Nazar, Nazarthrites, Nazarthrites uh, thought that being a son of Joseph and a resident of their own town gave them some leverage with Jesus, so they as Jews felt that being such gave them a monopoly on God's blessing. The people of Nazareth was willing to view themselves as the poor, the captives, and the downtrodden in, the, in, in that passage of Scripture uh, as, de, as depicted in a, by, uh, by Isaiah. But they were not willing to view themselves poor like the Gentiles, captive like the Gentiles, or downtrodden like the Gentiles. They just looked down on them. And, and, and evidently they had come to this point, this decision to, to say, if I must identify with the heathen Gentiles in order to be blessed by Messiah, I will have nothing to do with such a Messiah. 
And sadly, that, that attitude still is prevalent in Israel today. Uh, and let me go on and read this here. And it says in verse 29, they, they were, uh, 28, they says they were filled with rage. And 29, they got up, they drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built. I'm sure that they, they just a, just a, it was a mob mentality. They, they stood up, they grabbed him and uh, shouting at him, probably all kind of curses and, and everything else. And they say, what, you've said, what you just said is blasphemy. We all heard it. So now we're going to carry out the death penalty against you. So they grabbed him, and they were leading him to this brow of, of the city or the, or the village there of uh, Nazareth. Nazareth, it said, was about 800 feet above sea level as where it was uh, as compared to uh, the Sea of Galilee, which I, under, I understand is about 400 feet above uh, below sea level. So it was up pretty high there, but it was built on a hill and uh, they decided right here, if we look at this right here, in order to throw him down the cliff, they were going to kill him. It was their intent. But it wasn't going to happen because his time had not come. And ironically, if you think about it just for a moment here, they were looking for miracles. They wanted to see him uh, do some kind of miracle. Uh, you know, just just do a, do a magic trick for us. But the only thing that they, miracle that they got, which says in verse 30, but passing through the midst, he went his way. I just believe that, that, that when he stopped, the hands came loose from him. I believe the people parted like the Red Sea, and he just turned and walked. And I just believe that God just put blinders on them and they just looked around and he's gone. Uh, but he just walked right through them and he was headed back toward Capernaum is where he was going. And it says in verse 31, And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them in the Sabbath. It didn't sway him anything at all about what happened in the synagogue of Nazareth. He goes right back to, to Capernaum. He's in the synagogue. He's teaching again. So let me get to the application right here, and I'll just read these to you. Uh, as believers, we will face rejection by our community uh, uh, it, and our witness, but, you know, our, uh, rejection by our community uh, because of Christ and our witness for Him, especially when confronted with the, the attitude of today's culture. Today's culture, they want to push Christians to a side. Uh, a side. And as I heard David Jeremiah saying this morning, when he was commenting on the, the seven I am sayings of our Lord Jesus from John Ch uh, in, in John's gospel, and uh, these were offensive things to the, to the Jews when he said, I am. That was a declaration of him being God, going back to Exodus chapter 3 when God appeared to Moses there at the burning bush. He says, you tell him that I, I am has sent you. And so that was his name there. And I want to say this here also, when the Lord Jesus said that, that, that prophets were stoned, Listen to what Stephen had to say in Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Right before he was stoned, he asked the, the priests and Pharisees, uh, the, the ones who had, had, uh, had, had, had called for the death of the Lord Jesus, he asked them, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And he said, you're just like your fathers. They persecuted the prophets. It was said of Isaiah that his body, it was, he was an old man, his body was slid into a hollowed out log and they took a saw and they cut him in two there. Uh, even Isaiah the prophet, not to mention what happened with, with, uh, with uh, Jeremiah, all the persecution there being put in prison and put in a well. And our Lord Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5. 
He says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And he went on to tell them also in John chapter 16, he says, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. The way of believer is not an easy road. Our Lord Jesus said that we should deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. It's not an easy road. As some may say it is here. And, uh, and you know, we've just got to keep sharing the message. You know, persecution is going to come, like it did with the Lord Jesus. Uh, Paul even warned Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, uh, all who, who, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's happening today, uh, everywhere. And you just see Christians just being shut out of everything, even to the point of, uh, of governors uh, in, in Illinois, uh, when churches were meeting again, were fining churches because they were they they decide they, they said you know we have to meet together. This is our desire. It's that Holy Spirit that God has put in our hearts that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. They were taking that risk, and churches were being fined, and 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 and. We got to meet together. I've got to have it. You need it. We we need it. We need the fellowship. We need we need to hear the word preached. We need to hear the praises, song, worship lifted up to our Father in heaven, and our Lord Jesus Christ for His love for us. We need that. And so, just one last thing. I need to warn you about. There's this thing about being trying to be popular in our culture. One warning I give you with this, in order to be popular in the culture, that means you're gonna have to compromise some things. But we got to, we got to take a stand. Either we're gonna please the world or we're gonna please the Lord Jesus. That's just my warning to you. And God help us all to take a stand for Him no matter what. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you again for your grace, your mercy, your love. Lord, I just can't believe sometimes when I think about what a sinner that I was that you saved me. And even now, Lord, when I, when I give in to the temptations of the devil, I know I can confess my sins to you because I know you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And, and not just me only, but for all believers. But Lord, help us to freely share the message of the hope that we have. And to give a reason for that hope. Just to tell them what you did for us. Lord, I pray for our, our fellowship, the body here at 1025 Church. I pray for those that are sick, those who are going through trials. I pray for Brother Tommy. I just pray you strengthen him. And I pray right now for Miss Diane, that you will be with her. Uh, Lord, she is uh, suppo uh, supposed to have a uh, heart cath today. Uh, Lord, just uh, guide the doctors there. And I pray, Lord, that uh, many others are having surgery, uh, Lord, uh, that I've been told about. And some uh, even... Uh, Brother Jojo's granddaddy uh, has COVID-19. I pray for him, for Brother Carl, a faithful servant of yours for so many years, that you'll bless him, Lord. Be with him. And now, Lord, uh, just bless my feeble attempts, Lord, to lead this lesson. In this prayer, I pray, Lord, through Jesus, my Savior, asking in his name, amen. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. Look forward to seeing you on May the 31st, the day of Pentecost. God bless you.